Welcome to Audit the Audit, where we sort out the who and what and the right and wrong of police interactions. This episode covers freedom of the press, recording the police, and public property, and is brought to us by Michigan Constitutional Crusaders Channel. Be sure to check out the description below and give them the credit that they deserve. Before we dive into the interaction, I want to give a big thanks to the sponsor of this episode, Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community that offers membership with meaning. Not only does Skillshare offer its members thousands of unique and thoroughly developed classes, but it also allows members to connect to the support of fellow creatives and become a part of a community of inspiration and encouragement. Recently, I've been taking Ruman Alam's Creative Writing for All class to help me develop better writing habits. And I also learned a lot from Jeremy Mora's Adobe Illustrator class. Skillshare is already the most affordable place to learn valuable skills from home. But right now, the first 1,000 people to use the link in my description will get a free trial of Skillshare Premium. You have absolutely nothing to lose. So click on the link in the description to start enhancing your your creativity today. Thanks again to Skillshare for sponsoring this episode. At around noon on November 13th, 2020, officers of the Corona Police Department in Corona, Michigan, along with troopers from the Michigan State Police, were called to the scene of an individual threatening to jump from a utility tower near the Mitchell softball fields in Corona. First Amendment auditor and Bennington Township resident Matthew Roche arrived on the scene shortly after the officers and began live streaming the encounter. After streaming for several minutes with no issues, Mr. Roche was contacted by Trooper Murphy and Trooper Muyador of the Michigan State Police. What? It's public property. First Amendment protected activity. Unless you got it taped off, I can be here. Well, that might be true, but we're trying to do something. We're trying to get this guy to work with us. Okay, and that's why I'm standing a good distance away. Well, the more people he sees, the more he's getting agitated, okay? We don't want him to fall. We don't want him to go. I don't want him to do that either. Okay. That's why I'm staying way back here. Okay, could you go back a little further? Like, how far are you talking? Well, we're closer than we want to be, okay? Trooper Murphy politely asks Mr. Roche to back away from the scene and informs him that his presence may agitate the nearby suspect. I have covered the topic of crime scenes and an officer's authority to establish a crime scene in many of my past episodes, so I will not spend too much time on it in this video. But the doctrine of free speech plays a much more significant role in this encounter. Many have raised the question of whether the First Amendment's free press clause applies exclusively to journalists or to citizens as a whole. And although many Supreme Court holdings have suggested that the press clause does not grant the press special freedoms, the Supreme Court has not directly ruled on the issue. And some justices have expressed support for a distinction between the constitutional protections afforded to members of the press and those of the public. In the 1978 Supreme Court case of Houchins v. KQED, Justice Potter Stewart argued, quote, that the First Amendment speaks separately of freedom of speech and freedom of the press is no constitutional accident, but an acknowledgement of the critical role played by the press in American society. The Constitution requires sensitivity to that role and to the special needs of the press in performing it effectively. In the same year, Chief Justice Berger concluded that, quote, the court has not yet squarely resolved whether the press clause confers upon the institutional press any freedom from government restraint not enjoyed by all others. In the case of National Bank of Boston versus Bilotti, it stands to reason that members of the press are granted some measure of privilege given that they are allowed in exclusive information gathering locations and institutions that are not available to the public, such as the White House press room. Although the Supreme Court has not directly ruled on the issue, most circumstances where a citizen records an event involving government officials for the purpose of public dissemination have been upheld as protected under the First Amendment, particularly the recording of police officers. All that said, the legality of recording the police has largely been left to the circuit courts to decide, and some circuits have rendered mixed results. Unlike a majority of circuit courts, the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals, which presides over Michigan, has not directly upheld the right to record the police, and courts within the circuit have reached contradictory opinions regarding the matter. We will further discuss the legality of Mr. Roche's conduct in a moment, but the point of this this section is to highlight the fact that freedom of the press is somewhat of a constitutional gray area, and that the Sixth Circuit Court has not directly associated recording the police with the freedom of speech or freedom of the press. Alright. What's your name and badge number? My name's Trooper Murphy, badge number is 1189. Thank you, and what's yours? Trooper Molidor, 248. Okay. How about I stand by that pole over there, is that cool? Alright. I'm willing to compromise.
The troopers returned to their vehicles, and Mr. Roche peacefully complied with their request to move further back from the incident. According to this ABC 12 article, Mr. Roche claims that he was 477 feet from the encounter after moving at the troopers' request. After moving back, Mr. Roche continued to record for several minutes without being disturbed, until Corona Chief of Police Nick Churros spotted Mr. Roche and initiated contact. Hey you, I need you to get out of here. Nope. This is, crime scene. Get out of here. This is a First Amendment protected get activity. Out. Not touch you me. You go or I'm gonna arrest you. Arrest me. Out here. Me for what? I'm gonna arrest you. Do you want to call me and get this guy upset? Get out of here. I'm not interfering You're with anything. You're gonna get him upset. You're gonna get him upset. That's why I'm standing behind no, the pole. We don't need the camera here. Out of here. Like many states, Michigan's statute for interfering with an investigation is relatively vague, and the language of the law affords officers considerable discretion for its enforcement. Michigan Penal Code 750.478a states that a person shall not attempt to intimidate, hinder, or obstruct a public officer or a public employee or a peace officer in the discharge of his or her official duties by a use of unauthorized process. And the code fails to elaborate on what exactly constitutes obstructing. Chief Churros is a essentially putting forth the notion that Mr. Roche is obstructing the officers by recording. However, subsection 6 of the code directly addresses free speech by stating that this section does not prohibit individuals from assembling lawfully or lawful free expression of opinions or designation of group affiliation or association. Subsection 6's language is also somewhat unclear, but it does at least acknowledge First Amendment protections within the code itself. Although subsection 6 does not directly address the act of recording the police, it could be inferred that recording the police would fall under the umbrella of the phrase lawful free expression of opinions, but such a distinction would be left to a court to decide. There is a legitimate argument to be made that Mr. Roche's conduct did constitute an obstruction, because the suspect involved was experiencing an altered mental status, which could be exacerbated by the presence of strangers or a camera. Whether or not that argument would hold up in court is debatable, but courts often consider the implications of the factual happenings of a case just as much as the philosophical significance of their ruling. At this point in the interaction, it would not be wholly unreasonable for a court to find that Chief Churros' decision to tell Mr. Roche to leave served a significant governmental interest. But the chief's conduct becomes increasingly more difficult to justify as the interaction progresses. What are you going to arrest me for? For interfering. How am I interfering standing this far back? Back. How am I obstructing? Back. I told you to leave. This the city a, property, this, I can tell you to leave. Yeah, it's public property. No, city, go, go. Public property. Get out of here, I'm going to arrest you. For what? I just told you. As discussed on many previous episodes of ATA, states and municipalities do have the right to control their own property, and citizens can be legally trespassed from public property under certain circumstances. In the 1983 Supreme Court case of Perry Education Association versus Perry Local Educators Association, the court held that, quote, with respect to public property that is not, by tradition or government designation, a forum for public communication, a state may reserve the use of the property for its intended purposes, communicative or otherwise, as long as a regulation on speech is reasonable, and not an effort to suppress expression merely because public officials oppose the speaker's view. The Perry ruling affirmed that not all locations are appropriate for First Amendment expression, and that states may dictate how their property is used within reason. But the Perry ruling did not end there. In an effort to further clarify which locations were considered appropriate for free speech, the court went on to develop the doctrine of public forums. The public forum doctrine divided the general public into four distinct forums for free speech. Traditional public forums, designated public forums, limited public forums, and non-public forums. Traditional public forums include areas that have been traditionally open to political speech and debate, such as public parks and sidewalks. Speakers in this forum enjoy the strongest free speech protections, but even in this forum, speech is still subject to time, place, and manner restrictions. There is no doubt that Mr. Roche is exercising a First Amendment protected right within a traditional public forum, and thus is entitled to a considerable degree of constitutional protection. Protection. However, Chief Churros would have to prove that his restriction of Mr. Roche's free speech was not content-based and that it was narrowly tailored to advance a significant governmental interest. You want to get a lawsuit? I don't care what you do. You're getting out of here. No, I'm not. We're trying to negotiate something here and I don't need you here. And that's why I'm standing up. so far back. Get out of here. You need to leave, I'm going to arrest you. Last time I'm going to tell you. This is public property, sir. Last time I'm going to tell you. What's your name and badge number? I'm the chief of police. And what's your name? Nick. Nick what? Churros. Do you not know the Constitution that you swore to uphold? Get out of here.
Do you not know the Constitution? I told you last uphold? time. I am media. Chief Cheros places Mr. Roche into handcuffs and makes some interesting statements while leading him to the patrol car. What's your name? Don't go through my pockets. You got no right to. Shut the hell up. Unlawful arrest and you're unlawfully going through my pockets. Garrison Road. Oh, and then you throw my equipment on the ground? Nice. <clears throat> so now you're going to be rolling. Well, you're being one, so why not? No. Yeah. How'd you're stop? violating my rights. No, sir. listen. I give a f about your rights right now. Really? I'm not politically correct. So shove that up your ass. I could give a f less what you think. You understand? Okay. Yeah, I understand. I'm worried about that guy. And that's why I was hiding behind the And pole. I don't need you here doing this. So you're going to jail. You're going to learn the hard way. I told you about four times. I'm not going to learn the hard way. You are. No, I'm not. Hell yeah. Huh. you. You guys take down lodging for me? Pull this down and put a spunk in my eye. What do you want for uh, charges? Interfering and resisting obstruction. The suspect in the utility tower was successfully brought down and given mental health treatment, and Mr. Roche was arrested and taken to the Shiawassee County Jail, where he was detained for 22 hours before being released with no official charges. Four days after the encounter, the Corona City Council voted 7-0 to zero to fire Chief Churros after receiving hundreds of calls, emails, and voicemails from outraged citizens. ABC 12 also reported that because Chief Churros was fired without cause, he will keep his pension and benefits. In the same report, Mr. Roche declared to comment on whether or not he would be pursuing legal action, and the former chief, as well as the current city manager and mayor, all refused to comment. Overall, Chief Churros gets an F for displaying a blatant disregard for constitutional rights, maintaining a hostile and confrontational attitude throughout the encounter, and arresting Mr. Roche for exercising his First Amendment rights in a public forum. Any public official who displays such reckless neglect for constitutional rights should have their authority questioned at the very least, and in this case, Chief Churros sealed his own fate via the court of public opinion. Setting aside the chief's unprofessional remarks, much of his conduct could likely be considered unconstitutional. And if Mr. Roche decided to sue the department or city, it could potentially set a long-awaited precedent for recording the police in the Sixth Circuit. There are still many steps in the legal process before reaching that point, and many cases like this one result in an out-of-court settlement. But this case certainly has the potential to force the Sixth Circuit Court to rule on the issue if it were to be appealed to that level. Chief Churros' conduct was unnecessary likely illegal, and only served to create conflict. And I commend the Corona City Council for their decision to discharge him. Considering that Chief Churros was planning to retire in a month, and that he managed to retain his pension and benefits, there is little justice served in his firing. Mr. Roche gets an A, because although he could have chosen to remain silent more often, he did an excellent job of remaining calm and professional during the encounter, and maintained a healthy balance between invoking his rights and complying with the demands of the officers. Mr. Roche's willingness to comply with the initial troop request added significant credibility to his conduct while interacting with Chief Churros. Mr. Roche peacefully invoked his First Amendment rights and articulated his points in a respectful manner. I commend Mr. Roche for appropriately challenging the Chief's authority and maintaining a collected demeanor throughout the encounter. It will certainly be interesting to see whether Mr. Roche decides to pursue legal actions, and I recommend subscribing to the Michigan Constitutional Crusader for updates on this story. You can find a link to his channel in the description below. Trooper Murphy and Trooper Muyador get an A+ for approaching Mr. Roche calmly and respectfully, politely requesting Mr. Roche move back rather than issuing a command, and for compromising with Mr. Roche to find a solution that was fair to both parties. The Michigan troopers deserve recognition for their professionalism and civility. Much to the contrary of Chief Churros' conduct, the troopers did a great job of respecting Mr. Roche's rights, and I commend them for their reasonable attitude and courteous policing style. Let us know if there is an interaction or legal topic you would like us to discuss in the comments below. Thank you for watching, and don't forget to like and subscribe for more police interaction content.